Pretty much every iOS app these days makes some sort of HTTP request to a server. In this video, I'm gonna show you the basics of networking in an iOS application using URL session, and I'll show you how you can get JSON data and download files like images. So I've got an app here that has a label at the top and a button in the middle that says random. And if I tap on that button, nothing happens because I haven't written any code to do anything yet. But what I want to happen is I want this label to display a random Kanye West quote every time I tap that button. And fortunately for me, there is an API that I can use called api.kanye.rest that produces a random Kanye West quote every time you make an HTTP request and it returns the data as JSON. So all I have to do is make a request to this API, get the JSON data and put it into that label. So I'm gonna show you how to do this using URL session. I'm gonna start with a very basic example and then I'll work my way up to a more realistic, more complex example as we go through the video. So if I run this application right now and tap the random button, it's not going to display it in the label, but it's gonna print it out to the console. And that's because I'm just printing it out on line 31 instead of putting it in the label right now. So every time I tap this button, I'm gonna get that JSON object. So it looks like that in the browser. Uh, I'm gonna get that as a dictionary in Swift and then just print it out. And that's what we see here. I'm getting it as a string string dictionary. And every time I tap it, I get a new Kanye West quote. Now, if we take a look at the code, this first line here is creating the URL, uh, given the URL that I wanna get the data from. And because I know this is a valid URL string, I'm just gonna force unwrap this and that's fine. Then on line 22, I'm using the shared URL session to create a brand new data task. And this requires a URL, which I'm passing in right here, and this completion closure, this callback function that will get executed once the request completes. Now, it may complete successfully and I get the quote, or it may complete with an error. So always the first thing we do is check for an error. This is a network request and errors are not unlikely. So we can check for the error, we can handle the error in any way. Right now I'm just printing it. And if there's no error, then the body of the HTTP response, that's all of the, uh, the quote data, basically just this thing right here, that's gonna be in this data object. And we need to then pass that as a JSON object into a dictionary in this case. So we're taking that data, we're, we're forcing it into a dictionary, uh, and then I'm just printing out the quote here. Uh, notice also that when I create the data task here, I have to store it in a variable and then I have to resume that task because the URL session actually creates the task in a paused state. So we always have to remember to resume the task if we actually wanna make the HTTP request. Uh, that's a common mistake to just forget to put task.resume when you actually wanna make the request. So it's this URL session and the related objects with URL session that are actually responsible for executing these HTTP requests and getting us the data we need. As you can tell, I'm currently using a lot of forced unwrapped optionals around here and that's definitely not a good thing. This is just a really, really basic example just to get it working, but it's definitely not production ready code. We're gonna to have to add a lot more things before it's ready for a real application. Before we update all of that, I wanna just change this. So instead of printing out the JSON, I'm gonna put it in that label. So this is a dictionary where the key is quote and the text is actually the quote. So really all I need to do is set the labels text to be JSON quote. So now if I run this, we should see the text actually in the label rather than being printed out. So I'm gonna tap random and then nothing happens and I get an error. And this is because 
all of this code in the uh, completion closure is being executed on a background queue. So this is a, an HTTP request, it's a long running task. It has to run in the background, otherwise it's gonna block up all of the UI. So this just automatically, without us doing anything, will run on a background queue. We can't alter that, it will just have to run on a background queue. But when we update the UI, we have to update this on the main queue. So I have to add that dispatch queue.main.async right here and put that code inside of this block because this now tells the application anything inside of this block must run on the main queue. So now if I rerun the application, this should work perfectly. Actually, I should hit the random button and then we see that quote at the top and every time I tap that button, it's making that HTTP request, it's getting the JSON data back, it's passing that JSON data and then putting it into the label. And this is a, a really common way of doing things. You'll set up your data task, you'll uh, resume your data task, you'll check for errors, you'll pass your data that you actually need, and then perform any UI updates on that main queue. So this actually feels a little bit more like a real app now, now that we're actually updating the UI. But like I said, this code is pretty awful. Uh, we should be checking the response to make sure that the HTTP request was actually successful, so checking for a 200 status code. We should be actually trying this in a do try, and we should be not forcing so many things. So I'm gonna update this code to make it a little bit better. This is definitely more code now, but it's more like what you're gonna write in a real application, it's more realistic. So at the top, I'm now making sure that this response is actually an HTTP response. Once we get that, we can actually check the status code. And this is important of any HTTP API, that the code is the correct code we expect it to be, and that's gonna be in the 200 range. Then we wanna make sure we unwrap the data appropriately. And then we wanna try and get the JSON data from that data object. And only then do we wanna try setting that quote on the labels text. And this still works in the exact same way as before, but we're doing those appropriate checks. And in a real application, you would definitely wanna change these print statements to something more appropriate. So you could notify the user that something went wrong, or you could try and do something else, present the user with a different quote or something, but you wouldn't just rely on print statements. So this isn't the nicest code to look at, but it definitely does the job. The only thing that really bugs me here is the code right here, where we're taking that JSON object and we're converting it to this dictionary that's actually gonna turn out to be an optional, and it just, it doesn't feel quite right. I mean, we're in Swift, and I'd much prefer this to be an object. I don't wanna have to access things using quotes, <laughs> quote. Uh, I wanna do a dot syntax. I wanna access it as if it were a normal Swift object. And fortunately for us, this is a really, really easy thing to do in Swift. The first thing we have to do is create a struct or a class that contains the same properties as the JSON object. So this object only has a single property, it's called quote, and its type is a string. So my JSON object has a quote and its type is a string. And then as long as this conforms to the codable protocol, it will be able to be converted to and from a JSON object. So now in my view controller, instead of writing this code to just pass it into a dictionary, I can write this code to actually get the data into that Kanye struct. So now I have this object that I can use in a much nicer way. So I'll just go Kanye.quote. And that's how I can get the data out. And in this small example, it makes this code a tiny bit nicer but imagine a very large application where you're dealing with tons of properties and nested properties within your JSON. This comes in really, really handy. This is still working really nicely, but before we do anything else, I wanna get all of this networking code out of the view controller. In general, it's a really good idea to try and keep your view controller small, try and keep any code that doesn't have to be in there 
out of there. But networking code in general can really start to grow and get really, really big. So it's a really good idea to try and put this into its own place. So I'm just gonna take all of this code and I'm gonna create a class that is just responsible for all of the networking code in this application. So I'm just gonna call that networker, uh, but it doesn't really matter what I call it. And I'm gonna make this a class. And then I'll just make a function here that gets a quote. So I'll just call it get quote. And then I've dumped in the same code that I had in the view controller. Now, the big issue here, we're getting a warning about it, is that obviously this new class has no idea about the label from my view controller. So I can't just set the labels text here. I don't wanna set the labels text here. I wanna keep this more generic. So instead, this function needs to get that quote data out. It needs to be able to share it with the view controller. So the view controller can just call get quote and get that quote data. Uh, but because this is all asynchronous and happening on a different queue, I can't just return that value as I would if it were a normal function. So the way to handle this, the default way anyway, is to use a completion closure or a callback function. So now this function requires a closure to be passed in and it will pass either a Kanye object or an error object depending on how the request goes and it won't return anything. This also has to be marked with escaping so that Swift knows that this closure may get called even after this function has returned, which is generally the case with these asynchronous functions. So with this signature here, I can now, where I'm setting the label, I'm just gonna replace this with completion, pass in the Kanye object, and nil for the error. So if everything goes well, this should now work. It will call that completion closure, but we should also handle all of these errors. So I've created this networker error enum, just as I would if I was handling errors synchronously using throw and try and catch. But now I'm using it for this completion closure. So when there's the uh, bad response, I'm gonna pass that in as a parameter, I'm not gonna throw it. And I always have to pass it in as the second parameter and pass in nil for the first one. Then if there's a bad status code, I'll pass in that, or if there's bad data. So now every single time there's an error or there's success, I'm gonna call this completion handler and I'm always gonna make sure I'm calling it on the main queue so that there's no confusion there. So now from my view controller, uh, every time random quote gets called, I'm gonna create an instance of my networker and every time my random quote gets called, I'm going to call get quote, and then here is my completion handler. So this will either give me the object I want or an error. Uh, if there's an error, we'll handle it. Uh, I might just set the labels text to be error. And if there's no error, then we will set the labels text to be Kanye dot quote. And remember that because, oh, got to do self. Remember because uh, we are running all of these or running this block on the main queue here. So I'm always calling dispatch queue dot main dot async before calling completion. That means that I don't need to uh, explicitly run this on the main queue. It's already on the main queue. But if I didn't run those dispatch main async things within this function, I would have to run those uh, in the view controller. So you have to choose whether you're actually gonna run it in the view controller or in your networker code. Uh, just make sure that if you're updating the UI, that this is happening on the main queue. So now the behavior should be the same. There we go. Uh, except my view controller is significantly smaller now. And this is really nice. So all I have to do is say, I want the quote, I'll handle any errors, I'll handle the success case, and the rest of the networking code can just stay over here. Now, let's talk a little bit more about this URL session. I'm currently using the shared URL session, 
which is a singleton that any object in my application can use to perform any networking tasks. And this is fine to use this singleton uh, for simple cases like demonstrations like this, but in a real application, you're never really gonna use this shared instance of URL session. You're gonna instead want to create your own instance of a URL session. So you do something like this, where you create a URL session, but in order to create a URL session, you need a URL session configuration object. So you'll create a configuration object, and most likely you'll start with the default configuration. So then when you go to create your data task, it would be something like this. You just pass in your created session and create your data task this way. And the benefit of doing things this way is that you get to completely customize the configuration of the URL session. So this object can be used to configure things like timeouts and caching and network policies and all things that you might actually want to customize in your application. So we can create a configuration object using the default configuration and then customize it as needed. Most of the time the default's gonna be okay, but you can customize it as much as your application needs. Then we create the session from that configuration object and use that to create all these tasks. And by creating it this way, we have another option to actually provide a delegate to the URL session. So if we use this constructor to create the URL session object, we pass in the configuration, but we can also pass in a delegate. So let's say we wanted this object to be the delegate for the URL session. We could conform to the URL session delegate, and that would allow us to get notified about any data coming from the session and allow us to customize it a little bit further. And that means that we wouldn't use the callback closure like we are here. Instead, we do everything through delegates, which can sometimes be desirable. Most of the time, I don't use this. I prefer to just use the callback closures and I already have enough control, everything I need. But it's another option when you're creating your sessions this way. Another thing to notice here is that every application will probably only ever need a single session for the entire application. So instead of creating a brand new session every single time I want to get a quote, it would be better to maybe do something like this. Now I'm creating a shared instance of the networker class, so it's a singleton that contains that URL session object. And now every other object in my code can just access this shared instance of my networker. And now they're all using the same session and configuration, which is usually what you want in your applications. We can use the configuration and the URL session to configure options that will apply to every request we make using this URL session. But what about when we need to modify the options for a single URL request? For example, what if I needed to change this to be a post request or I needed to add some sort of authorization token or modify any other header information? We can do this using the URL request object, which is very similar to the URL object. We construct it using a URL, but, but we can modify things, for example, the HTTP method to turn it into something like maybe a post request. Of course, this one needs to be a get request, so I'll just leave it at that. But then we can pass that URL request to the session's data task constructor instead of passing in a URL. And that just allows us to customize more things. So we have the URL request and the session objects, but the really interesting things are happening with the tasks. So the session is used to create a task, in this case a data task, but the task is the thing that's actually doing the URL request and handling all of that data. And the URL session object can create different types of tasks depending on what we're trying to achieve. So the data task here is used when we need to retrieve small amounts of data that will fit into memory. So this is like getting JSON or XML. But if we needed to say download a file like an image, we would want to use the download task which downloads all of the data and stores it in a temporary file. Or if we wanted to do the opposite of that and upload a file, we could use an upload task. Or if we're dealing with WebSockets, we can use a WebSocket task. 
So the session creates the tasks and the tasks are the thing that actually do the requests. So downloading a file like an image is actually a really common thing that you'll want to do in your application. So I'm going to create another function here that will grab an image every time the function is called and then we can display that in a UI image view. So now the app works in the same way, but it's downloading this image from Kanye West's Wikipedia page and presenting that in an image view. And if we take a look at the code in the networker here, the download image function is almost identical to the get quote function. It has a URL, it has a session and a task, and it has all of those checks to make sure that everything went well. But instead of using a data task, it uses a download task. And when we use a download task, we end up with a local URL, as opposed to a data task where we get data. So data is in-memory data, and this is a local URL to a file in the temporary directory where the image now exists. So this isn't gonna be persisted. Uh, it will go away at some point. So we have to do something with that data but it currently exists in a temporary location on the device. So we can then use that to uh, load the data into memory so we can actually put it in an image view. So right here, instead of, uh, instead of using the JSON data, we're actually just taking that local URL, bringing it into in-memory data, and then passing that over back using the completion handler, which in the view controller we're then using to set the image on the image view. And I've just hooked up a new image view, and I should actually uh, make this the shared instance. And yeah, now running the app, as soon as it starts up, it does that HTTP request, takes a second, and shows that image right there. We've gone over the basics of HTTP requests to get Kanye West JSON data and images into an iOS app. So try some of these techniques out in your own applications, and stay tuned for more videos on iOS development. Thank you.